Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for coming in. I am so excited to have to be here and to be with you guys. And before I get started, I have a few jokes to get the room started. Um, quick question. What is Jesus' favorite car? The Chrysler. Get it? <laughs> All right. One more. Why did Adam and Eve do math every day? Because they were told to be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. <laughs> all right, so the topic of the day is joy. We all want joy. We, but the problem is we don't know how to get that joy. We live in a world where we're constantly bombarded with bad news, with anxiety, with fear, with depression. But the, we're going to learn today what the key is to have joy. And it's as simple as understanding how much God loves you, how much God is for you. And I'm here to tell you that God is a God of love, a God that loves you unconditionally. And throughout the scriptures today, we're going to learn the difference between two disciples. One of them focused on his love for God. The other one focused on God's love for him. And you're going to see in the scriptures what happens when we glorify and when we focus on how much Jesus loves us? But what happens when we all our effort and our strength is focusing on our, our love for Jesus and the comparing and contrasting and how we can receive all the blessings of God, all the promises of God in our lives because it is yes and amen. And I'm here to tell you that he is for you. So let's get ready and learn how we can live a life full of joy. So real quick, my name is... Igor Martinez, I'm the pastoral resident at Hoboken Grace, and it's an honor and a privilege to be with you guys. I came here in New Jersey when I was about eight years old, and I've been here ever since. I'm familiar with a few of you. Daniela, my simple service buddy, I got Baba family, I got Colin, who's in my dinner group. So I a few of you guys that I know, and I'm so excited and so privileged to be with you guys. So I wanna start off the scripture, which changed my life completely. And it made me realize how much God is for me and not against me. And it's 3 John chapter two, where it says, beloved, I wish above all things you prosper, be in health, even as your soul prospers. So we're gonna talk about God's love and how that enables us to, for us to live a life full of joy. And look how that scripture begins with, it's the word beloved. Every time God tries to explain or reminds us how much we are loved, he always uses strong words like be beloved. And he wishes above all things that you prosper, be in health, even as your soul prospers. He wants you to prosper in everything you do. He wants you to prosper in your relationships. He wants you to prosper in your family relationships. He wants you to prosper in your studies, in your job applications, in everything you do, he wants you to prosper. He also wants you to be in health. If you're struggling with any sickness, any physical sickness or any physical diseases or any emotional pain in your life, you know, the scripture says that he comes to heal the hearts of the brokenhearted and he winds up their wounds and he wants you healthy. That's why most of Jesus' miracles when he was here on earth where most of them were healing. And he wishes that also your soul prospers, that your prayer life could be on point with God, that your Bible reading time, it could be on point, that you could be set free from any addictions or any bondages or any bad habits that you may be struggling with. He wishes above all things that you prosper, that you be in health, even as your soul prospers. And for me growing up, that was hard for me to understand that because I always saw God as the God that I had to meet the certain standards. And I thought that if I didn't meet those standards, he wouldn't bless me. He wouldn't answer my prayers. But when I found out that it's all about grace, grace means undeserved, unmerited favor because of what he did for us at the cross of Calvary and paid the bill for all of our blessings in our life. We can receive everything because he loves us unconditionally that's why scripture says that it is he came to give us life and have it more abundantly the devil comes to steal kill and destroy but jesus comes your god comes that you may have a life and have it more abundantly and that demonstration was shown to us 
at the cross of Calvary, when he who knew no sin became sin, so you might become the righteousness of God. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm here to tell you that you are a new creation. All things have passed away. All your sins, all of your mistakes, all your shames, all things were passed away. And behold, all things have become new. You are now who God says you are. You're blessed. You're highly afraid. You're more than a conqueror. You are the new creation. And at the cross of Calvary, Jesus took your sins and your shame upon himself so you can receive his righteousness and his holiness. That's why when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm here to tell you that you are at right standing with him because all sin and all shame was paid for you at the cross of Calvary. You are right now standing here as a believer the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, because Jesus didn't do sin. The scripture says in him was no sin. He did no sin. Yeah, notice how Jesus, he did no sin. In him was no sin. Yeah, he did no sin. Yeah, became sin. So us, by doing no righteousness, it's the same way that he did not do sin, we become righteousness. It's the divide exchange. He takes your sins, you take his righteousness. That's why you have the right to come to him, to the throne, for any prayer request, and all his promises are yes and amen. And you can rest assured that you have the right for your prayers to be answered because it's not what, because of what you do. It's because of what Jesus did for you at the cross. And not only is your right standing with God, not only was that purchased for you, but also your healing because Jesus, he himself, Isaiah 53 says, took all of your infirmities, all of your sicknesses, all of your diseases upon himself. So by his stripes, you are healed. He takes your sins and your sicknesses to receive his right standing and you can receive healing and wholeness. And even if you're dealing with lack, you know, as students, you might be dealing with student loans. He also took care of that as he is your provider. As Second Corinthians says that this is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich for your sakes, he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. At the cross, he became lack, so you could have more than enough because he is your shepherd and you don't have to lack. So you could also be a blessing to the people around you. And not only that, the everything that Jesus paid for it keeps on going. At the cross, he also took your anxiety, all your fears, and all your stress because at the cross of Calvary, he died with a crown of thorns in his head. Why? Because that symbolizes all of the stress, all of the fear, all of the anxiety. If you're dealing with a paper report that you have to do, or if you're dealing with maybe a uh, job struggles, he took all that shame. He took all that anxiety upon himself so you could receive that peace that surpasses all understanding. You could have acceptance with God because Jesus said, why have you forsaken me, God? So you and I could say, thank you, Lord, that you will never leave me nor forsake me. He died young at the age of 33 so we could live a long life. With long life, he will satisfy us and show us his salvation. That is the demonstration of God's love for us. That at the cross of Calvary, he paid for everything that you will need in this life because he is for you. You need to be conscious of that. God is a God of love that nothing can separate you from the love of God. And the scripture says nothing means nothing. And it's important to have that consciousness and be established in that fact that God loves you and that he is for you. Because when you do, when you're established in that fact, you're going to live like John, the disciple. So right now, quickly, I want to talk about the difference between John and Peter. Are you the kind of believer that is always focusing and boasting on how much Jesus loves you? Or are you one of those believers that your focus and your strength is trying to live for God? We're going to look at these two stories right now. The story of John and the story of Peter. How John was focusing on Jesus' love for him and was able to live a godly life. But Peter, on the other hand, was focusing on his love. For Jesus and he failed again and again. So right now, um, I want to read to you Matthew chapter 26, verse 33 to 35. I'll wait a few seconds so you guys can have it.
Matthew 26, verse 33 to 35, Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. You will deny me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. So right here is Peter. His focus was not on Jesus. His focus was on his, him himself. And in his eyes were on him, not on Jesus. Yes, Lord, I will do this for you. Yes, yes, me, I will. The, the focus here is I, 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 I. And he failed because Jesus was not in the center. When Jesus is in the center, you're going to live for him. And look what happened with John. John chapter 13, 20. John chapter 13, 21 to 23. Well, you guys are ready. I'm going to give it a few seconds so you guys can look it up. And we're going to see how, what happens when your focus is on how much Jesus loves you. John chapter 13, verse 21 to 23. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he met. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. So this happened at the Lord's Supper. All the disciples were there. They were all talking. They were breaking bread. But notice how John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one that was focusing on his, Jesus' love for him, was reclining next to him. And that is a picture of him focusing, meditating, and relying on how much Jesus loves him. And it's a picture of rest because you could rest assured. And when you know God is for you and God loves you, everything will be all right. If it's a presentation that you have to do, if it's a job application, it's a job interview, or it's a, a test that you have to study, you could rest assured that when you lean on his love, everything will be all right because he cares for you. That's why the scripture says in 2 Peter, casting all of your cares I love this version. It says, casting all of your cares, all of your worries, all of your fears, all of your concerns, once and for all upon him, because he cares about you with deepest love. I love that version. He cares about you with deepest love and watches over you very carefully. And I want to focus on the last part. Why do you cast all your cares, all your worries, all of your concerns upon him, all of your fears? Because he cares about you. Because he cares about you with deepest love. He watches over you very careful. He knows exactly what you're going through. All that pain, all that hurt, all that anxiety that's trying to creep in. He knows exactly what you're going through. And he's there with you. He doesn't want you to carry that burden because we cannot do it alone. We have a heavenly father that loves us. That takes care of him. That takes care of us. And you can rest assured. You could cast all those cares upon him anytime any fear anxiety or any worry comes you by faith just throw those cares at him say thank you lord that they are now in your hands and i just rest just like john was resting on jesus let's learn how to rest on his love and know that he is for us and there's something interesting happens in the book of john a few instances in the book of john every time john finishes a sentence as we just read right now the words the disciple whom Jesus loves, are there. Now, as I was growing up uh, reading the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke, and John, the only emphasis that says the disciple whom Jesus loved is in the book of John. So in my head, I'm thinking, wow, uh, maybe he was Jesus' favorite. Maybe there was a secret that John knew that the other disciples didn't know about. But no, actually, when you read the book of John, the only one that says that is John. Why? Because John was actually meditating on the fact that Jesus loved him. He was one of the few, the only disciple that was actually focusing on how much Jesus loved them. He was meditating. He was focused on that. And his focus and his meditation and his life was always practicing how much Jesus loved them. And what happened? Right here, you're going to see that he was one of the only, he was the only disciple that was at the cross of Calvary. Out of all the disciples, 
that were there. The only one who was a disciple at the cross was John. What does that say? That says that when you are conscious how much Jesus loves you, you're going to live for him effortlessly. Instead of you trying to live for him, you're going to live a godly life, a life that will bring testimony to your life and the people around you effortlessly when you're focused on how much Jesus loves you. And that's why the scripture says that it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. You know, there's a story about the woman called, caught in adultery, you know, the Pharisees, the religious Pharisees were like, we caught her in adultery, Jesus, what are you going to do? And then Jesus says, who are those that condemn you? Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Notice how it was the gift of acceptance. Notice how it was the gift of no condemnation. Notice how it was the gift of no more shame, the gift of acceptance, the gift of that the giftness that she was his beloved that gave her the power to go and sin no more. That's why it's important for us to realize that it's God's love, that's God's unconditional love that will give us the joy and the peace that we need. And another instance about Peter and John was um, when Peter, this disowned Jesus, now Peter, Matthew chapter 26, Verse 69 through 75. I'm giving a few seconds so you guys can look it up. So to recap, we're trying to see the difference between God's love for us and our love for God. When we are focused on how much God loves us, we're going to live for him effortlessly. But when we focus on our own strength, trying to live for God for, out of our own strength, we will sadly fail. Because our focus is not in Jesus. Our focus is on ourselves. So Peter says right here, chapter 69, now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were the Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out of the gateway where another servant girl saw him and he said to the people, this fellow man was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again and with an oath, I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know that man. Immediately the rooster crowded and then, the, then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crowd, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept barely. So there you have it. He tried to lift God out of his own strength. And when the pressure came in, he couldn't. John, on the other hand, as we learn, was the only disciple that was there with Jesus. Because when you are conscious of how much God loves you, you're going to do great things because he is for you. So John chapter 19, verse 26. I'm going to give you a few seconds so you guys can look it up. He is for you. Always remember that he is for you. You can rest assured that everything will be all right in your life because he loves you. When Jesus saw his mother there, Mary, and the disciple whom he loved was standing nearby, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And that's what you are. You are the disciple whom Jesus loved. You are the daughter, the son whom Jesus loved. And there's a powerful truth to know the fact that you are his beloved, when you accept him as Lord and Savior, the scripture says you are accepted in the beloved. You are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You are more than a conqueror. All of you are more than a conqueror. If you guys are students, you are more than a conqueror to achieve the dreams that God has placed in your heart, in your hearts. And this is what happens when you start focusing on that and make that love of God for you personally. That's why the apostle Paul says that he is the son of God who gave himself for me. The apostle Paul was meditating and was personalizing. Yes, he got died for the whole world, but he was personalizing the love that God had for him, that he gave himself for me. He gave himself for you because he is for you. And there's a powerful truth in knowing that you are his beloved you know nothing can separate you from the love of god and look what happens when god gave the son the acceptance there's a story in scripture where 
Jesus is about to be baptized and the heavens are open. And God says to Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Look at the power that the word beloved has in our lives. When we are conscious out of the fact that we are beloved, look what happens. Then Jesus goes to be tempted by the devil. And what does this devil do? He tells Jesus, if you are the son of God, you could make these stones turn to bread. So the father just said, you are my beloved son. When the devil came to tempt Jesus, he said, if you are the son of God, he left out a word, beloved. The devil left out the word beloved. Why? Because it's counterproductive to the devil to remind you, you are loved. He, the last thing he wants you to do is, is for you to remember that you are loved because he knows that all temptation, he knows all fears, all anxiety, all stress will fall away when you are conscious that you are the one whom he loves and you are the one who he loves. That's why it's important to know that truth that you can have that joy when you are the conscious that you are the one whom he loves. And even if you don't feel that you are the one whom he loves, because all of your past mistakes, knowing that all of your mistakes were put away and you're a new creation. And that's why when, the, when that happened, when the father said, this is my beloved son and who I'm well pleased in the Jordan River, the Jordan River is actually the lowest place of all planet earth. The second time he said, this is my beloved son and who I am well pleased was a mount of transfiguration, which is actually the highest place in all of earth. And once that says that even in the lowest moment of your life, he's still saying to you, you are my beloved son and who you, I am well pleased. Even in the highest moment of your life, he's saying to you, you are still my beloved son, my beloved daughter and whom I am well pleased. So shake off all that shame, that condemnation, because God is proud of you. He loves you. He has a great plan for your life. And God's unconditional love and grace is so powerful that he didn't leave Peter by himself. As the story of Peter does not end there. Peter's restoration, restoration by Jesus is one of the most touching scenes in the New Testament. The Lord not only forgave Peter, who had denied him not once, but three times to save his own skin, but also restored him and entrusted the care of the infant church to him. When Jesus rose from the grave, he instructed the angel of the tomb to tell Mary, go tell his disciples and Peter. And notice how Jesus knew all the condemnation, how bad Peter fell because he failed Jesus. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he did not just leave Peter alone. So he's not leaving you alone, even when you make a mistake. He makes sure that go tell Peter that I am alive, that everything is all right. That's the God you serve, a God of love, forgiveness, full of grace, full of favor, because he is for you. So he went back to his old job, Peter, and that's where Jesus found him. Fishing on the Lake of Galilee, the Bible tells us that Jesus gave Peter and the fishermen with him an abundant cash and also made them breakfast on a fire of coals. The scene of men sitting around to fire to keep warm in the early morning must have been painfully reminded Peter of what had just been done a few days earlier. What was the Lord doing? He was showing Peter that he didn't hold that sin against him. And then Peter didn't have to be afraid of that memory anymore. What a loving savior. What a God we serve that he knows all of our failures, but he does, doesn't hold them against you because he has completely forgiven you and made you righteous and he is for you and he wishes above all things that you reign in life. He has forgiven you through his death at the cross and like Peter let the Lord's forgiveness and love for you restore you to wholeness and proper you into the God-giving destiny that he has for you. So the key to find joy is believing how much he loves you. It's so simple. You know, a lot of us, we have that in our heart. Like, yeah, God loves me. God loves me. Yeah. But do we actually believe it in our heart? You know, this perfect love that casts out all fear. If you have 
any fear in your life, you need a revelation how much that, how much he loves you because that, knowing that fact that he loves you will drive out every fear. If, there, if you are struggling in school or trying to find a job, you know that is his perfect love that because he is for you, he will take care of you because if he takes care of the lilies of the fields and the birds that fly by the air, how much more is he gonna take care of you? You know, the Sermon of the Mount is a great demonstration, always reminding us that if he takes care of the lilies of the field, he's also gonna take care of you because he is your healer. You don't have to be afraid because he's gonna come through and when you trust him, and yes, there will be afflictions. We live in a fallen world. There will be problems in our lives, but be good rest assured that when that problem comes, you're gonna be ready because he loves you, he will heal you. And notice that Ephesians says that, how do we get joy? Is to know the love of God that gives us the fullness of God. So you guys could take a second to look up Ephesians chapter three, verse 14. And we're gonna read the scripture how, what is the key to being filled with the fullness of God? Is knowing how much God Loves you. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glory riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted, established in love may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide, long, high, deep is the love of Christ. To know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So what is the key to you to have joy in this life? To be filled with the fullness of God. And how are you filled with the fullness of God? Meditating and believing that he loves you. Be like John. Whatever life throws at you, he's, I am the one whom Jesus loves. Actually, that's also, if you are having trouble sleeping, know, go to sleep knowing how much he loves you because he gives his beloved, the scripture says, sweet sleep and what is the key there when you're conscious that you're his beloved you shall have a good night's sleep it's all about god's love that's why the word says that faith works by love whatever you're believing for in life the foundation must be that because you are loved you could expect your prayers to be answered so that's how we get there you know how do we put this into practice you know i love reading the four gospels because the four gospels just demonstrates jesus love unconditional love and grace and there's a story in the bible where it just demonstrates how jesus is willing he is willing to say yes and amen to all of your prayer requests you know as i was hearing all your prayer requests that you guys were um praying for job applications health all all your prayer requests for God are yes and amen. And he is willing because if he did not spare his own son, how will he not freely, the scripture says, give us all things because that's how much he loves you and how much he is for you. And there's the story in the scriptures about the leper, you know, the leper was actually an uh, outcast. No one wanted to be around the leper they were cursed, they were spit at, they were hit. Nobody wanted to even look at a leper. Yet Jesus, after he gives the Sermon of the Mount, on the Mount, talking about not worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink, but just trust that he will take care of you. He goes up to the leper. The leper doesn't go up to Jesus. God knew that someone needed his love and his grace and his healing power. So Jesus goes up to the leper and the leper knows that Jesus can heal. We all know that God can do great things in our life. He is God. But do we actually know that he wants to bless us, that he wants to be there for us? And this is what the lepers said. Remember, the lepers, lepers are cursed. No one want to be around them. They were short outcasts. They were always by themselves. And he was scared. He didn't know if Jesus actually wanted to heal them. So 
the leper goes to Jesus and tells him, I know, can you make me clean? And Jesus responds with, I am willing to be cleansed. He's telling you that. He's telling you right now, whatever situation, whatever bad report, whatever situation your family you might be dealing with, he's telling you right now that he is willing for you to get that job back. He is willing for you to get that promotion. He is willing for you to pass that exam. He is willing because he loves you and he is for you. So to put things to practice, let's do that throughout this week. Let's just focus on how much he loves you. Don't let shame, fear, condemnation prepend, but just know that he loves you and he is for you. And you'll be filled with the fullness of God. You're going to be filled with joy and whatever life throws at you, you're going to be ready because the same way that you are a student and you study for your test and you're so confident when that test comes that you're going to pass it. Why? Because you study it. That's why it's important for us to study the scriptures and to meditate and know how much Jesus loves us because whatever, when life comes at us, we're going to rest assured that because he loves me, I am going to get out of this situation because greater is the one who's in me that the one who is in the world. And for last, I want to read the scriptures that just emphasizes how much he loves us. That nothing, and I mean nothing, can separate you from the love of God. And it's Romans chapter 8, verse 31. I'll give you a few seconds so you, you guys can look it up. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against you? If God is for you, who can be against you? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up, gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? How is he not going to give you that? job help you pass that exam heal you from that depression heal you from that sickness and set you free from that habit who will bring any charge against those whom god has chosen it is god who justifies. when you accept jesus as the lord and savior you are at right standing with him and you can rest assured that your prayers have the right to be answered who is the one who condemns no one why? Because there is for now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, was raised to life and is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, or a danger or a sore as is written for your sake? We face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. None in all these things. We are moved. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You are more than a conqueror because he loves you. Verse 38 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And I want to end it by reminding you that you are loved and because you are loved, you could expect come good things to come your way because you're not alone in this world. You have a heavenly father. And if he takes care of the lilies of the fields and the birds that fly by the air, neither toil nor reap how much more is he going to take care of you. So let's put that into practice in the next couple of weeks. Let's read the four gospels. See Jesus healing if you need healing. See Jesus providing as he multiplied the loaves and the fishes. See Jesus in the scriptures because he loves you. And he is for you. See Jesus giving that woman caught in adultery the gift of no condemnation. The gift of acceptance that gave her the power 
to go and see no more. See Jesus as your beloved father that will take care of you. So let's all close our eyes and let's just end this service speaking the blessing over you guys' lives. Thank you, Father, for this message. Thank you, Lord, that we were all reminded how much you love us and how much you are for us. Thank you, Lord, that we are your beloved in whom you are well pleased. Thank you, Lord, for this new covenant that the focus is not on us anymore, but the focus is on you. We want to thank you, Lord, that because you're a good God, we expect good things to come our way. And in Jesus' name, I'll lift up all these Stephen students that you're blessed, and Father, be with them, that you may give unto him, Lord, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, that the eyes of their heart might be enlightened in order that they may know what is the hope of their calling, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have given each one of them specific gifts and specific talents to establish your kingdom here on earth. So in Jesus' name, I declare your blessing. I declare promotion in their way. I declare that their applications will stand out because it's filled with your favor. That you, Father, will bless the work of their hands because everything they touch prospers. Thank you, Lord. As they go to job interviews, they're going to win that interview because they're not going there alone, but you're going to give them supernatural favor. That same favor that Esther had, same favor that Joseph had. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. I speak for protection over their life. You shall protect them from all evil, from all dangers, and from all accidents. And thank you, Lord, that all their prayers are answers because all of your promises for their life are yes and amen. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, Igor. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, all right. As I said earlier, our events, you guys probably know them by now. Um, but quick before we close out, I just remembered a prayer request I saw in the Newman group chat uh, for Abby Neal. Her friend is getting a brain surgery tomorrow. So I was wondering if we could pray quick for that because that's kind of urgent. Um, yeah. Dear Lord, um, I just thank you so much that we're reminded tonight of your incredible love for us and the joy we can have knowing how much you love us, Lord. We thank you that you hear our prayers and we just uh, bring before you Abby's friend who's getting brain surgery tomorrow. Lord, it sounds like they don't know what the, um, how this tumor is, if it's malignant or not. Um, but I just pray that you would give wisdom to the doctors and that every part of the surgery would be blessed by you, that you just bring healing in an amazing way and show your mercy to this person and his family. And we thank you, Lord, for this night and our amazing speaker, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for the spontaneous prayer. Um, and then next week, we will have Sarah Esselborn. I apparently we have Sydney. Small groups is in, in 104 this week. Um, sorry. Next week we will have Sarah Esselborn speaking on peace. And that is all I have for you guys tonight. So have a lovely night. Thank you for coming.